this broken world where there are natural disasters and there's natural disasters in my own life and there's hurt and there's pain and there's broken relationships, there's all these things happening, this brokenness of this world, this is the worst you and I will ever experience for the rest of eternity is this world. You all sounded really well. There's a reason I sit in the front row. There are actually two reasons. One, so I can hear all of you sing. And the second reason is so nobody can hear me sing. <laughs> I'm in the front row. so. Uh, and I just want to say that's a song we can sing even when it's not well with our soul. Because music and worship is a declaration of what we know to be true, not what we feel. And if you walked into the room today and things aren't well, I'm so glad you're here. I pray that God would, would meet you. We are in the middle of a series called The Search. It's the book of Ecclesiastes, which is a really difficult book to understand. So give me some grace on that. So our, I think our fourth week in the series, we are in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I want to ask for some grace as well, because last week, the title of this sermon last week was beautiful in its time, and I didn't even get to that verse. So this is part two of beautiful in its time. So we're going to look at Ecclesiastes 3. If you have a Bible, you can follow along. Verse 9, the author writes, after he lists all the different feelings and emotions and times chalked full, a time for this and a time for that, a time for this, all of these feelings that we experience throughout our life, and sometimes we experience them within five minutes. All those feelings in five minutes. The ups and the downs of, of life. Jesus experienced many of those feelings and emotions listed in Ecclesiastes 3. Verse 9, the author, the preacher, asks the question, What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. And pause, highlight, circle, underline, bold, whatever you need to do, verse 11. This verse does not get enough credit. This is the most incredible verse in all of the Bible. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. He has made, who? God. God has made everything. Everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Verse 14, I perceive that whatever God has done endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it. So that people fear before him that that which is already has been, and that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. There's a lot happening in this passage. It's like this author, the preacher, makes a statement of truth, and then he asks a question, and then he says, life is all meaningless. What's the point? So trying to understand what's the author saying here. Verse 11 is really, really significant. And I want to bookend, just, just mark beautiful in its time. I'll come back to that. But the second half of verse 11 talks about God has written on every human's heart, every person who has ever been born, every person who's ever lived, and every part and corner of the world, God has written on their hearts eternity. There is something in each and every one of us that tells us this is not it. There is something more. This is not the end. I am longing for, I desire something else that this world does not satisfy. And the author says, every person with a Sharpie, it's written on all of our hearts, eternity. There's, there's something more. Romans chapter 1 says something similar. Since what may be known in Romans 1.19 about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. God has revealed himself to every person who's ever lived. 
Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, they've been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. It's when we stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon, unless it's a foggy day, if you drove up for four hours and it was all fog, I'm sorry, go back. But you stood there at the rim of the Grand Canyon, right? And I can tell you what you didn't say. You didn't look at the Grand Canyon and say, oh my word, I am amazing. You said, this is amazing. This, whoever made this is amazing. Somebody made this. And when you see a beautiful sunset and you see a beautiful sunrise, most of the time, we're not thinking how great I am, but all of creation is pointing to a creator. And that's what Romans 1 is saying. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22 of Romans 1, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. It's like, was this written this week? Right? We see things happen. We see decisions made. We see laws passed. You're like, that is foolish. But in their eyes, it's wise. Well, this was true thousands of years ago. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Eternity is written in all of our hearts. Every person that you've ever interacted with at one point in their life, they laid their head on their pillow and they wondered about what was next. They may tell you they haven't. They're suppressing that. They're hiding it. They don't want to deal with it. But our neighbors, our coworkers, the people that we hang out with, those who have no faith background, they know there is more, there is something else because it is, it is a desire within, and a longing within every person. There's something, there's something else. Uh, a well-known missionary or missiologist, his name's Don Richardson, the late Don Richardson. He wrote a book called Peace Child. If you wanna dive more into missions, you could read this book. But he writes about the phrase eternity in their hearts to describe the phenomenon of redemptive analogies in most all Aboriginal cultures. Almost every culture has traditions, customs, or ways of thinking that reflect basic biblical truth. Things like marriage exist. You go in where there's never been a missionary and there's, there's some biblical truth. Eternity is written on their hearts. And so he goes on to write that there's, these can be used by missionaries to explain the gospel, right? Eternity is written on everybody's heart. So what does that mean for you and I today? It means that as a follower of Jesus, for those in the room who've placed their faith and trust in Jesus, the best is yet to come. In every area of life, we are to live that the best is not behind us. If, you, if there there's anybody in the room who feels like my best days of life are in the past, that will be a self-proclaiming prophecy if you believe that. But the best is yet to come. I don't care if you're one years of age or 99, the best is to come. God has something better for you. Keep your fork. Dessert's coming. <laughs> for every follower of Jesus. The best is not here. The best is to come. It is, it is beyond anything we could hope or imagine what God has for us in the future. And forgive us, God, when we think the best is in the past. If it's been good, it's only gonna get better. If it's been tough, it's gonna ease up. If it's been hard, it's gonna get better. If it's good, it's gonna get better. No matter where you find yourself, it will be better. And we are to live in the hope in every area of our life that it will be better. So we're a follower of Jesus. We, we have a living hope that tomorrow is better than today in every aspect of life. For a follower of Jesus or for any person who has eternity written on their heart, it means that for this world, if for a follower of Jesus, this world is as the worst it will ever get for your eternity. This broken world where there are natural disasters and there's natural disasters in my own life and there's hurt and there's pain and there's broken relationships. There's all these things happening. This brokenness of this world 
This is the worst you and I will ever experience for the rest of eternity is this world. For followers of Jesus in the room, it's only going to get better. For those who do not know Jesus, if you're a friend here today, you were invited, I'm so glad you're here. If you don't know Jesus, this world is the best you will ever experience for your eternity without Jesus in your life. And so I extend an invitation for you to put your faith and trust in Jesus. Eternity is not a reward. I remember growing up in church and eternal life, eternal life, eternal life was talked about a lot, like it's a reward. No, eternal life is something every person experiences. Every person on the planet will live forever. We were not made just for this world. We're made for something more. Eternity is written on our, our hearts. Just to help explain this, Francis Chan used this illustration a number of years ago. I've used it in youth group a long time ago, and it's still, it's still pretty effective. This rope is eternity. Now, this rope could go around the world. It only goes to the other side of the stage, but it could go around the world if you wanted it to around and around and around for thousands and thousands of miles. There's a little piece of green tape there in the middle, and that tape is way too big, but it represents your life on this earth. James 4.14 says, our life is like a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. It is just a little blip in eternity. And it goes on and on and on and on. And yet, I still get frustrated in the drive through Why? A good question we should ask every day, what is this going to matter in the scope of eternity? In the scope of my entire existence, how important is this? Why am I frustrated over something that's it's not even going to matter tomorrow, much less eternity? This is your life on this side. And so there's some practical truth for us today as we contemplate this. I hope you can see the green. I thought green went really well on gold, like Packers colors. Uh, I just, just may be mentioning that. Your life, we are to live in the light of eternity. Microphones will work perfectly on the other side. In the light of eternity, there's some things for us to just contemplate and reflect on. There are some things that we do today that we will not do in eternity. There are some things that will continue and there's some things that will end. Worship is the ultimate goal for all of us, right? To, to worship. Uh, we, we had the opportunity to do that for a few minutes here this morning. That's, that's preparation for what's going to be like. Are we going to really get stand around the throne and, and sing songs all the time? Whatever I know, it's going to be amazing. Better than anything we can imagine. It is going to be so good. It's going to be incredible what God has for us. But there are some things that we only do on this side that will not exist in heaven. And one of those things is missions. Missions exist in places where worship does not. Why do we have missionaries to bring the opportunity for people to recognize their purpose in life and to worship? So that's why we have missions. Why do we have personal evangelism? Personal evangelism is me sharing my faith with somebody else. That won't, that won't happen in heaven. Missions will cease in heaven. Altar calls will cease in heaven. The opportunity to invite somebody who doesn't know Jesus will cease in heaven. Local churches will not exist in heaven. Local churches are for the here and now to bring the hope of Jesus to this world. That is why we exist. And it's oh, so temporary. Local churches are not meant to last forever. But we have an opportunity. And you have an opportunity. Because here's what I play out in heaven. And I don't Give me some grace on this because I've never been. There are some things scripture tells us about heaven. One is Jesus will wipe every tear from our eye, but the Bible also says there'll be no tears in heaven. I'm not sure how that all plays out. Are there tears and then he wipes them away and then there's no more tears? What are the tears? 
I think the tears are going to be overwhelming sense of joy and completion that what I don't understand in this broken world, things don't make sense. I wish I knew more. I wish I knew what God was doing in the time frame that he was doing it, but I live with the unknown. And then when I meet him, everything is complete. And Jesus is like, I was with you when you went through all, when you had all those questions, I was with you. And he's going to, he's going to take his robe and he's going to wipe our tears away. That's coming. That day is going to happen. There's some things in eternity I I play out. Um, I believe there's going to be people, there's going to be a reunion in heaven of people you've never met on this side. But because somebody gave or because you served or because you, you gave to a missionary who's going to a far away place that's happening in our church this week. We have a family leaving for a far away land and some of you gave and somebody might come to faith that you will never meet. And I believe there might be a reunion in heaven. Hey, you don't know me, but I am here for eternity because you gave to this missionary family. That's what living in light of eternity looks like. Because you served in in the preschool, in children's ministry, a child came to know Jesus, and now you get to be with them for eternity. The things and decisions that we make, how we steward our gifts and skills and times impact eternity. And I believe we're gonna have some of those reunions and some of those conversations. We go on in chapter three of Ecclesiastes. Moreover, the author says, I saw under the sun, there's that familiar saying, under the sun, that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. In the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. If you've ever said, that's not fair. If you've ever seen something play out in this world, in your community, in your family, in your personal life, you've said, this is not fair. This is not right. I can't believe this is happening. You are correct. Because this world is brokenness and wickedness is exchanged for righteousness and vice versa. That is happening all the time. We are born with an innate sense of that. Every person, their heart, it's, we were given a conscience. Every person has it to know good from evil. It exists. We all know that. We all know when something, someone is treated unfairly, we rise up and we're aware of that. And that's, what's, that's what the author is talking about. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that themselves are but beasts. Now he starts to take this turn to talk about animals. I'm not going to go all the way there, but I know you all have questions about our little cats and dogs. I lean on the dog side here. For what happens to the children of man is what happens to the beast is the same as one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the beast. For all is vanity. If you live for under the sun, dust to dust is man, just like dust to dust is our animals. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will after him? What's the author saying? Half the times, I don't know. But there's a few things in this text. Number one, it is okay to enjoy some things on this side. It is okay to enjoy some good things that God has given to us. Whether a person knows Jesus or not, God has given what we call general grace to every person. Every person here, whether you know Jesus or not, you have an opportunity to have food to eat today. It's general grace. Every good thing that anyone on the planet has ever experienced, general grace. God's general grace falls upon every person. And then there's specific grace that falls upon followers of Jesus. What does it mean to be a child of God through the person and the work of Jesus? There's special grace given to followers of Jesus. What does that mean? There are people that we interact with on a daily basis who eternity is written in their hearts and they have a conscience and they're wondering what's, what happens next. And I play out in heaven this, this scene. I don't know if it's accurate or not, but I play out. Actually, it is because there's a parable in, 
in the Bible about somebody who, who dies. And they ask a living person, would you please go and tell my family? And I play out this scene in heaven of people who I knew coming to me and saying, why, why, why didn't you tell me? For eternity. For eternity. We have eternity to live. And I had a few short moments with somebody and I never shared Jesus with them. So this is a call for the church. This is a call for us as individuals, the people that we have. We have a few short moments to interact with them and to share the hope that we have that there is the way and his name is Jesus and he loves them and cares about them and he longs to spend eternity with them to give them a chance let them decide but it breaks my heart to think of the opportunities that somebody might say but you never said anything to me you knew all this time you were my neighbor for 12 years and you never said anything to me live in light of eternity, that the opportunity we have for just a short window of time to share Jesus for eternity. He talks about wickedness. He talks about righteousness in this passage. There's also this idea that we all will give an account one day for the time and the, the gifts and the skills and the money that we were to steward here on earth. The New Testament talks about and actually gives it a name. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. You and I have a personal one-on-one -on -one appointment with Jesus one day. It is not something we should fear. We should look forward to that. And he's a busy guy. You have a one-on-one -on -one appointment with Jesus. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And, and it's a conversation I, he's not, he, he doesn't use guilt to motivate us. He, it's not gonna be a guilt trip like we're all used to. But he's going to ask us about what he gave us, the skills, the time, the gifts, the resources. And we're going to give an account for what we did with the things he gave us. It is not a matter of salvation is simply a conversation that he has with us. It's not something we should fear, but it's something we should be aware of and the good. And it should, it should remind us that everything I have is on loan from God. I don't own anything. I have asked, I've been asked to steward my time and my gifts and my resources for his honor and for his glory. And one day we'll have that conversation with him. There's another judgment, and it's something we also need to be aware of. It's called the great white throne judgment. And it's where those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus are separated from those who haven't. And we should be mindful of that as we interact with people far from God. And I want, and I, I want to share with you, Boulder Mountain is a place for people who've been following Jesus for 80 years, who walk in with their Bible full of notes and color-coded and everything, they are welcome here, as well as the person who's never been to church before and has no idea who Jesus is. Both are welcome here. Because our prayer and our desire is that we would have an opportunity as a, as a local church, because the church is the hope of the world as we preach Jesus to our community and our neighborhood. And there was a day where that will stop, and so we have a limited window of time to reach Northeast Mesa, to reach our neighbors, to reach our community, to reach our, our HOAs, to reach Apache Junction. We have a limited amount of time. And I believe God's going to ask us, how did we steward as a church the resources that we had to reach, to reach people? Now let's go back to verse 11. I didn't skip over it. I want to come back to it. For God has made it what? Everything beautiful in its time. What it doesn't say is in my time. What it doesn't say is in your time. And some of you have been waiting years for things to be beautiful in a certain area of your life. If God were to give everything to us, 
for us to fully understand completely, then we would have no need for God. But we live on this side, not understanding everything, so that I might depend on God even more. There are some things he's given to me and there's some things he has not yet revealed to me. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, what, I, what we now see dimly one day will be made clear. It will all be made clear. Everything will be made make sense one day when we stand face to face with Jesus, but that day is not today. And let me say to you, if it, things are not beautiful in your life, then it's not time. Another way it's been said is, if it's not good, God's not done. But I think that leaves us lacking a little bit because God might be done, but it's just not time. When my wife bakes amazing things, she's an amazing baker, and that banana bread comes out of the oven, it's done, but it's not time to eat it yet. So I'm told. (laughs) Right? There's good things that are done, but it's not time. Galatians 4, Paul writes in Galatians chapter 4, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. There was a perfect time where God sent his son. And if you do not have sonship or daughtership in him, Today can be that day you trust him and him alone for the forgiveness of your sins. You receive the specific grace through the person of Jesus today because eternity is a really long time. And we were all created for worship. We were designed. You know it. You feel it. You feel it in your bones every morning when you wake up and when you go to bed at night that there is something more. This is not it. And the Bible says you, what you feel, what you sense is correct. Eternity is a really long time. And what makes heaven heaven is God is there. That we are in the presence of Jesus. I don't know all the details. Someday we might do a whole series on heaven. But what I do know is it is good. What God has for you is really, really good. And until that day, until things make sense, until I have more clarity, until I have more knowledge, I I do think we're going to learn some things in heaven. The New Testament teaches us that in heaven, we'll still learn. There's some new revelation. We'll, We'll learn some things. But on this side, as things are incomplete, we are to trust and we're to wait, we're to long. There's a, a book recently that I read called Hope Heals. And it tells the story of a young couple just getting started in, in their life, Catherine and Jay Wolf. They met in college, married. They moved to L.A. to pursue law school for Jay in the entertainment industry for Catherine. Their son, James, was born in 20, 2007. And six months later, Catherine miraculously survived a catastrophic stroke caused by a congenital brain defect she never knew she had. Here's their wedding photo. After a 16-hour brain surgery, 40 days in the ICU, a year in neuro rehab, and 11 operations, she continues her recovery to this day. In 2015, she gave birth to a miracle baby, John, who has blown up their lives in every way they talk about. But I want you to listen to a quote from their book, Hope heals. If you want to dive further into this, because here's what, here's the reality. Every one of us in this room, we walk with a limp. Every one of us in the room, we walk around with brokenness and scars from this world that don't make sense, and it's unfair, and it hurts, but we long for a better world. This is what she says about her life that she lives as a follower of Jesus. What has happened to me is extreme, Catherine writes. However, it is not that different than from what everyone else deals with. Here's a picture of their family. I am sort of a microcosm for what we all feel. I can barely walk, but even with a cane. But who feels free even if they can? 
My face is paralyzed, but who feels beautiful even when they look normal? I have no coordination in my right hand, so I can't hold things, even my child. But who feels like a competent parent, even if all their faculties are intact, right? For months, I could not eat, and even today, I have difficulty swallowing. But who feels fully satisfied, even if they can enjoy every delectable treat they desire? She says, I'm tired almost all the time now, but who always feels energized to engage fully in their life? My voice is messed up, but who feels understood, even if they can speak plainly? I have double vision, but who sees everything clearly, even if they can see normally? My future is uncertain, but I trust in Jesus. She says, but whose future isn't uncertain, right? On this side, Catherine Wolfe, in the book, Hope Heals, a true story of overwhelming loss and overcoming love. And she talks about these things that happen in life as, as detours. And detours are part of our plan that God has for us. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. What would it look like as a follower of Jesus to live in light of eternity? At work, at home, in our neighborhood, in our local church, to live in light of eternity, to know that I might not see what I'm doing is making a difference, but I'm gonna trust God that one day he might reveal to me how I use my gifts, how I use my skills, how I use my finances, how I use my time. I'm gonna trust him on that. This life moves way too fast. We have a lot of time together, my friends. Let's, let's spend some time creating some stories that we'll be able to swap in eternity, all right? If there are some things in our life that we've realized are, are, are broken because of our own actions and because of our own behavior, I'm so glad you're here. Life's too short to continue to live with those things without dealing with them. To really heal from those things, we got to deal with them. This Friday evening, we're offering something called Life's Healing Choices. It's eight weeks. It's an opportunity to begin to address some hurts, habits, or hangups that we all might have. It's Friday nights. We'll have childcare provided in this room at, at 6.30. It's a safe place non-judgmental place. It's a place a follower of Jesus can come in. Somebody who doesn't know Jesus can come in and, and work on some things. If you have a friend or family member who's struggling, I would encourage you, hey, I'll go with you. Say, hey, uh, this is going on in our church. I'll go with you. It's led by Aaron, Aaron Bohannon on Friday nights at 6.30. Would you join me in prayer as we close? Father, thank you that we look forward to dessert. The best is yet to come. May we live in light of eternity this week when it comes to the people who may not know Jesus. We have the cure. And uh, forgive us when we have not shared that with others. God, your grace has reached us. I pray that we would use it to impact and influence our community, our neighborhood. And teach us to trust you to make things beautiful in your time. We long for everything to be made complete. We long for the day where everything is made right. Everything. We know that that's just not today. We long for your appearance. We look forward to your coming. In Jesus' name.